Okay, so um, last lecture we looked at uh, the derivation of the diffusion constant in a gas uh, based upon kinetic theory. Um, and um, in this lecture, we are going to look at um, first a, a very poor man's version of the diffusion constant, uh, deriving it again, uh, very simply. And eventually we'll go through and derive uh, the conductivity um, of an ideal gas, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity as well. And we will finally get to what I think is the most interesting, or at least the most novel result in the whole course, which is a result about the viscosity of gases, uh, which the viscosity of gases doesn't sound very interesting, but the result is so unusual uh, that it's... Uh, it becomes interesting. Okay, so first um, we're going to look at a derivation of the diffusion constant um, D, uh, which we derived last time uh, via a, a slightly sophisticated kinetic uh, theory um, calculation. Um, but we're going to look at a, a simpler way of deriving it. Now, if you have a, a gas molecule diffusing in, um, in a gas, uh, it will bounce off other molecules and it will... Um, it will bounce around uh, and do, do this kind of thing, all right, all over the place, okay? Um, and when it does that, uh, it's undergoing a random walk, okay? And we know the random walk it undergoes is of length, um, is of length uh, lambda, um, on average, before it collides with another molecule. So it undergoes random steps of length lambda, okay? In between each step, it's just moving roughly at the mean speed. Okay, so it uh, undergoes uh, a distance of this, t times v mean, if t is the time um, for the, for the, for the uh, between collisions, um, or if t is the, uh, the total time of which it's, uh, it's walked. So in a time t, we have t v mean divided by lambda collisions. That's the number of collisions it's undergone in a time t. Okay, and each collision... Uh, is of size lambda, and you know for a random walk that the distance you go, x squared, is proportional to, more or less equal in fact, depending on the, depending on the dimension, n times the distance which it goes per, um, per, per, per step, in step size, squared. Okay, so if we take, uh, you want to figure out how far the thing has gone, the particle has gone in a time uh, a t, then the answer is how many collisions has it got undergone? It's taken that many collisions. Each collision undergoes, uh, between collisions undergoes a length lambda. So that's the answer there. Uh, and um, and so x squared goes as uh, time times lambda divided by the mean velocity. And if you look at that and compare it with this result here, you will find that the diffusion constant is basically one sixth of lambda times v mean, the, the mean velocity, which is a very good estimate uh, of uh, the actual diffusion constant. Okay, so that's the poor man's version of, the, of that system, of that particular derivation. All right, so to look at um, uh, this system, we need first to look at uh, continuity, uh, and in order to write the diffusion equation, for instance, and continuity is basically just uh, conservation of molecules, okay, conservation of stuff. And you should all have seen this equation before. This is the con continuity equation. This is n is the number density of particles. J is the, 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 uh, the current density of particles, um, uh, the, the mass, the, the number, number current density. Uh, and uh, conservation of particles will give you this. Now, if you haven't seen it before, I'm going to go through a proof for you in one dimension first, okay? So, Let's take um, a slice in one dimension. So I've got a slice between x and x plus dx, just there. Um, and that slice has area A coming out of the plane of the board. So you have to imagine a plane, uh, plane of the page, area A coming out, okay? And the number of particles flowing in from the left is just the mass current density, which is not the mass, the number current density, which is the number of particles uh, per unit area per unit time times the area times the time. So in time dt, you get that many particles. You get that many particles there coming in. 
and then you've got the number of particles flowing out on of this bit. So we've got the number of particles flowing in, the number of particles flowing out at that particular side is just this, the current density at x plus dx, and the total change, the number of particles is just number in minus number out, and that's the total number of particles because it's area times dx, which is volume, uh, times dn is the change in the number of particles, and if you just do the Taylor series expansion of this bit, you get that, okay? And hence, uh, if we do all this kind of stuff, uh, we end up with this equation here, which is the one-dimensional version of that equation, okay? You can do things uh, a little better than that. You can use the divergence theorem, uh, which you should all have seen in your uh, vector calculus courses. Um, you'll know that course in electromagnetism as well, uh, that JDA is is, uh, D, in, in, is the same thing as in the volume integral of div J. So you can do the same thing. Apply that and you will, you will get that result. Okay, apply that to a small, a small area, small volume. Okay, so um, that's the continuity equation. So we have the continuity equation here. We have our fixed law, which says that the matter current density is proportional to the gradient of the number density times the diffusion constant. And so put those together, put that into there, and you can end up with the diffusion equation. Okay, dn dt is d times grad squared of n. Okay, and that's an equation which occurs all the time in physics, all the time. Okay, so. Uh, let's try and solve that equation. It's already real, real, all very well to write down an equation like that, but uh, we'd like to be able to solve it, at least in some cases. Uh, and the simplest kind of case, at least in 3D, would be to start with a system of particles, of n particles. Um, so here's x, y, z. Um, here's n particles, big N. Uh, this is the number density of particles, and we're going to make it a delta function. So it's, it's going to start at the origin. So I'll make a different colored pen here. We're going to start with just the origin, um, uh, all the particles at the origin, okay? Uh, and um, then what happens, of course, is they start diffusing out all over the place, okay? And we'd like to know uh, what the density of these particles is here, n, uh, as a function of position, which would be r here, and time, okay? And uh, the total number of particles, of course, must remain as n. You can't, we can't get rid of particles. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, well, of course, it's gonna be spherically symmetric, so we don't need to worry about the vector r, but only the radius, the radius r, this sort of thing here, okay? Uh, and if we do that, we can uh, magically solve this equation. Um, the best way to see the solution is just plug it back in um, and see it satisfies this particular equation, will set this particular solution will satisfy uh, that. Uh, initial condition and it will also satisfy the um, the uh, diffusion equation which is that one there okay if you plug those in you'll find it's true uh, note in the textbook there's a there's a usual kind of error okay integrating this over all space in spherical polars um, so remember in spherical polars when you're doing spherical polars you're not in Cartesian coordinates anymore your integrals are over d phi and integral over r has an r squared and the integral over theta has a d cos theta. So the volume element is in spherical polars is not, you know, d phi d theta dr or something weird like that. It's it's this. It's it's d phi uh, sine theta d theta r squared dr. That's the volume element in spherical polars, and that's why this integral looks like this. So, um, and that of course will always yield n for all time. Otherwise, we'd be losing particles. And if we want the, uh, the in the mean squared distance moved uh, in some particular time, what we do is we integrate um, r squared times n and divide by n, okay, over all space. This is over all space here. Uh, and we find out the answer is 6 dt, a result which we used before. Okay, so that's how far the particles move in a time t. They go, their distance squared goes as the time and the proportionality constant is diffusion constant, in this case times 6. This 6 just changes with dimensionality, but the d times t doesn't change with dimensionality. It's always the case. 1d, 2d, 3d, 8d, whatever. Okay? Now, well, what do those sort of solutions look like? Well, um, 
here's a case where I've got absorbing bounding conditions and it's probably in 1D, yes, it's in 1D, it's in X. Um, I started off with a pulse at the origin. Um, this, is not a, this is not a delta function pulse, this one, it's a, some sort of Gaussian pulse. I've started off with a Gaussian pulse. Then I've let it um, expand and diffuse away. So of course the number of particles at the origin decreases a bit uh, and you get more particles well away from the origin and you get this sort of curve looks like looks looks like this, okay. And eventually, of course, I'm using absorbing boundary conditions here. So what, basically, what's happening is when a particle gets to the to the boundary, it's taken away, and so the number of particles, which is basically the area under this graph here, um, decreases. This you know, and uh, basically, eventually, you end up with no particles at all. But this is how it how it evolves. Okay, it's a typical diffusion equation solution. It's not doing anything spectacularly interesting. You don't get oscillations or anything like that with the diffusion equation. Everything just slowly diffuses away. Okay. Now, um, for some books on this subject. Um, I'm always recommending books, basically because, um, how would I say, uh, serious academic stuff is in books. Websites tend not to have very much that's serious uh, or can be relied upon. And the reason for that is not because the people writing websites are idiots, they're very clever normally, but they are not putting the time in that you need to write a book. Um, and they do not have the leisure time, and they realise web pages disappear very, very fast. Books are pretty much forever. Uh, so um, there are two books here which are very interesting, not interesting, I suppose is the wrong word, very useful in this area of diffusion. Um, the first one is uh, by a man called Crank, and it's called The Mathematics of Diffusion. Um, the second one is a much older book uh, called The Conduction of Heat in Solids. Now, conduction, the heat conduction equation and the diffusion equation are basically the same thing. And so these two books are basically the same topic. Uh, this one's by Carslaw and Yeager. Carslaw was a Cambridge mathematician, I think, who eventually became professor at the University of Sydney. Um, and the, the building the building there is named after in the maths building. Jaeger was at the Australian National University. He's a geophysicist, um, and of course, conduction of heat is very important in geophysics. Uh, and there's Jaeger at the opening of University House with uh, with uh, Prince Philip, who is 98 and is still going strong. Um, so these books not are not particularly exciting books. Uh, in fact, if you find them exciting, there's probably something a little bit wrong with you, I suspect. But uh, they are extremely useful books if you happen to meet a diffusion equation which you cannot solve. Um, and diffusion equations occur all the time. They don't just occur in, uh, in stat met courses. Um, they occur all the time in the real world. Lots of things are diffusing. For example, we will eventually see that the log of the stock market price for any stock, uh, to a good approximation, undergoes a random walk. So some of you will probably at some stage be working in the financial sector You'll be looking at um, options, pricing, and all these kind of financial derivatives, uh, and basically diffusion equations will be your bread and butter. And so these books are, are useful in that area. Okay, so having done uh, diffusion, we will now look at um, thermal conductivity. Now, so as I said before, thermal conductivity is pretty much the same thing as diffusion, so we're gonna go through this a bit more rapidly. Um, so thermal conductivity is basically saying uh, if you have uh, uh, a steel bar, you're hitting at this end, um, you want to know uh, if you put your hand at this end, um, when will it get hot? And how, how, you know, how rapidly does the heat travel across along here? Okay, so these two equations are the same thing, thermal conductivity equation and the, uh, and the, um, and the diffusion equation are basically the same. Uh, here's the diffusion equation again in 1D. Here's the thermal uh, conductivity equation, which looks like that. Um, and so uh, we've already derived the diffusion equation. We derived the thermal conductivity equation fairly rapidly. Okay. So we get the thermal conductivity, which is given the Greek letter kappa normally. Um, and in deriving the diffusion equation, we were looking at current of actual particles, number of particles. Okay. Um, but in deriving kappa, we're looking at the current of energy. Okay. So each particle carries a certain amount of energy, and we know from Miku partition that we can approximate that to a very good, very high accuracy uh, by um, the, part, the, the energy per particle is equal to kBT uh, times, uh, times nu, the, um, 
the number of oh, it's, a, it's a numerical constant related to degrees of freedom of course okay so this energy here um, could be uh, translational kinetic energy okay so if you have a monotonic gas it's only got translational kinetic energy and that and so nu is three on two um, but it could be other things it could also be rotational or vibrational okay so this nu can be um, really has to be at least three on two for a classical system um, but it could, uh, it could in principle be, uh, be very large indeed for a complex molecule. Okay. So um, again, we're going to take a surface at z equals zero and look at particles coming at it from either side, um, a, uh, a mean free path away, just as we did for the diffusion constant. Um, and the energy carried by the particles might be different because there might be a, a temperature gradient. Okay, so the temperature gradient will drive um, uh, the thermal flux. So um, let's do that. I won't write down the, the full derivation as we did before, but I'll remind you what we did for the um, for the case of a uh, of, uh, of diffusion. You know, we had uh, a, a surface here, a plane there, sorry, and uh, another plane lambda away, one one mean free path away, another plane over here, one mean free path away, and we looked at uh, the stuff coming in to here. From, from the outside, from one mean free path away here and leaving it one free, one free path in that direction. So we've got a current coming from the left to the right and a current going from the right to the left. The current coming from the left to the right is um, of thermal energy is the number of particles per unit time per unit area, which is that thing, times the energy per particle, which is the energy per particle at minus lambda, position minus lambda. And similarly for the right, like that. Uh, and so we know what this uh, this particular guy is, uh, this this particular thing, the 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 the, 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 uh, the number of particles per unit area per unit time, given the symbol i, and that's given by quarter times the density times the mean uh, velocity. Okay, uh, and so then we take those two, we subtract uh, the current that's coming from the left from the right to the left from the current that's coming to the left to the right. And we get the thermal uh, energy per unit area per unit time uh, hitting our surface. Now, um, when you see this derived in books, uh, they tend to make the amazing assumption that um, although T varies in space, so looking at a system which has a temperature gradient, um, the number density and the mean speed do not. Okay, and the idea that the density will not vary with temperature sounds odd, and certainly since uh, the mean uh, speed goes as T to the half we cannot really accept a constant V mean, okay. Now we can include all these variations of one and two, but they just change their answer by a numerical prefactor, which we're gonna change anyway. So we're gonna throw, we're gonna ignore this uh, complication, which looks pretty significant, but we're just gonna ignore it, okay. So proceed by fudging now. Um, we're gonna take, um, do a Taylor series of the, uh, of the, um, of the uh, total um, the total flux. So we're gonna take this equation here and we're gonna put that in there and that in there as well. Uh, and when we do that, we're gonna tailor series out the, um, the uh, energy per particle. So that's the energy per particle at the plane uh, minus lambda dE dz, which gives us the energy per particle, the correction due to the fact that it's at minus lambda. Here's, here's, the, um, here's the bit of plus lambda here. Uh, when we put that all together, what we end up with is just uh, this here, okay? Because we know E, uh, energy of epsilon, the energy of a particle goes as, or is equal to, so it gets equal to um, U K B T, okay? So that is the uh, flux of heat energy, punit area, punit time um, coming through our, our system. Uh, and if we multiply by the magic two-thirds to get rid of all the really weird approximations we're getting, uh, we made, we can get out the um, thermal conductivity, kappa, uh, which has this form, a third times the, uh, uh, the energy per particle, multiplying factor, the mean speed, the, the uh, mean free path, the density of particles, and the Boltzmann's constant, okay? And you can write that in a number of ways which are alternative, okay? Uh, and, you know, you can introduce this specific heat of constant volume, which is clearly related to this, okay? Or you can introduce the diffusion constant because the diffusion constant itself, of course, it has many of these parameters in it, many of those parameters. So you can write it in a whole of different ways. Um, 
you are not expected for the purposes of examinations to remember any of these expressions. You will get the expression uh, in, in, in a formula sheet and maybe you'll have to use it in some cases, but you're certainly not expected to remember uh, these, uh, these, all these crazy results. They're, uh, they're, they're, there's too many of them for a start and uh, you'd only forget them as soon as you did the exam. Okay, so um, what is the dependence of the conductivity on the pressure? That's a good physical question. Here we have our formula. Let's look at how it depends upon the pressure. Okay, so um, mean free path times n, if we go back uh, to earlier results, you will see that that just depends on the molecular diameter through this equation. Okay, so we can write the thermal conductivity in as this particular result here, uh, which is just there. And you will see if we write it that way, we've got nu here, which is constant, okay, so the number of, not the number of degrees of freedom, but the, the proportionality constant in the energy equation. We've got the temperature here, we've got the mass of the particle, we've got the diameter of the particle, we've got Boltzmann constant. None of this stuff depends at all on the density, on the density of the gas or the pressure. Okay, so the pressure does not occur in this equation. So Everything being equal, the thermal conductivity is independent of the pressure. Okay, uh, And that is what is found experimentally. If you do the experiment, here's the thermal conductivity of some particular gas, I'm not sure which one, um, versus pressure in Tor. Now, Tor is a very small unit of pressure. It's 10 to the minus 3 atmospheres. So here's, um, here we're getting down to a very low atmosphere. So, so, this, so one atmosphere is basically up, up here somewhere, I suppose. That's one atmosphere. If you go below one atmosphere, eventually, of course, you will find... Uh, that the thermal conductivity does depend upon the pressure. But for most pressures which, you know, you'll experience in everyday life, it's independent of the pressure, okay? Eventually it breaks down down here because, of course, you get into a regime where you're, uh, you have such a low pressure that we no longer have uh, collisions occurring um, over the size of the box. So um, we're getting into the, into, the, into the regime where there's sort of collisionless uh, system. But... Basically, experimentally, this result is confirmed. The thermal conductivity is independent of the pressure. What about the dependence of thermal conductivity on temperature and on, um, and on the heat capacity constant volume? Okay, So you will see here that the cap of the thermal conductivity depends upon temperature uh, weekly, but, you know, T to the half, it's not, not, not immeasurable. Um, but it depends strongly on nu, on the heat capacity or the number of degrees of freedom. So you see, there's a proportionality constant here. So large complicated molecules, if I draw a complicated molecule, it has all kinds of you know arms on it and things like this, okay? That will have a very large nu, okay? Um, it's got many ways of storing energy, many vibrational modes, etc., etc. So it can store a lot of energy. Um, and they should have a very large thermal conductivity. Um, however, this is somewhat negated by this horrible factor of d to the minus 2 here, which says that the larger your molecule, uh, the, the weaker, the, 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 less, the less conductivity is. Okay, so large molecules also have a large d, so you do pay a price for having a large molecule. You might, this might be improved, but this might be, you know, uh, negate that effect. Okay. So, let's look at the thermal conduction equation now. We derive the thermal conductivity. What's the equa equation we need to use? So, we derived the diffusion equation before. Now, we have to derive the thermal conduction equation. Hmm. Okay. So, again, we consider a slab. Here's our slab between x and x plus dx. Our slab has area A poking out of the, out of the plane. It's coming out of the plane. Um, and for the left, we have a energy uh, of this um, or power and something, power flowing into the slab of, of, uh, of that size, A times Jx, and we have this much power flowing out on the right. So the total power in, if you do the Taylor series expansion, you will get the power going in, the total power going in is minus A dJ dx dx. And we've, remember, we've now said what J is. We know, we know that J is minus K dT dx. Okay. So therefore, we can write the power in is equal to this. And when we do that, um, we get a, uh, we get a, um, 
that increase in power, the amount of power flowing in, the energy per unit time flowing in, gives us an increase in temperature, which is just this. Uh, and the increase in temperature is just the increase in power divided by the heat capacity of our system. Okay, so normally you'd write um, delta T equals uh, energy in, say delta Q divided by heat capacity. Okay, and we can derive divide that divide that by um, by dt if we wanted to. So we just delta t delta t there, uh, dt, uh, and this would be the power in. This would be the change in temperature, and that's the heat capacity. And so that's what that equation basically is. Um, and c is the heat capacity per unit volume here. So we're going to multiply by the volume of our slab, which is adx. And when we do that, and everything cancels out. We end up with um, this equation here, which is the heat heat conduction equation. Okay, dt dx is 1 on c uh, uh, times dx, d dx of kappa dt dx. Okay, um, now, so that's our heat conduction equation, which looks very similar to the fusion equation. Um, now, if we have a case where the conductivity is constant, so that was constant, okay, we can take it out the front there, and we end up with dt dx is alpha d squared t dx squared, uh, which gives us a, a simpler heat conduction equation where alpha is kappa on C is the thermal diffusivity. You can see it's then pretty much exactly the same as the heat conduction equation because we'd have, uh, sorry, exactly the same as the diffusion equation, dn dt, we would have d, d squared n dx squared. Okay, so we would get the same thing again. Uh, so you can see why this thing here is called the thermal diffusivity because it's quite the diffusion constant. Okay, so let's look at an example of uh, heat conduction. So in many ordinary solids, we usually assume that this thermal conductivity uh, is independent of temperature, okay? Uh, which is what we've assumed um, to some extent is independent of space and therefore independent of temperature here. So we've sort of assumed that when we did this, okay? Um, this is only approximately true, but it's good for some materials. Um, Here's, uh, what's this one? This is this is tantalum uh, and niobium here. They've got tantalum and niobium. And you can see these two things have, have a fairly broad temperature range. We're dealing with 1,000 degrees here. The thermal conductivity is, is reasonably constant. It's not, doesn't vary very much. Um, and so we get end up with this, this nice diffusion equation, nice thermal conductivity equation. So if we can assume that the thermal conductivity is a constant, um, we can start solving some problems that are reasonably easy, easily. Now, uh, let's do a very classical one, an extremely simple one. We've got uh, a lower plate here at some temperature, got another plate here at some other temperature, Ts, um, uh, and um, we want to know what the steady state temperature is between the plates. So if I'm uh, keeping this one at, uh, at, at zero degrees and this one at 100 degrees, what's the temperature in between? Okay. So um, in the steady state, when there's no time variation, of course, this thing is zero. Um, because, and because that's zero, the right-hand side of the, of the heat conduction equation must also be zero, so that must be zero. Uh, so the second derivative of temperature with distance, we're gonna make this distance here, I'm gonna change this, so that's x, not y, okay? Um, and we can solve that equation really readily, okay? It's a second order thing, you just, uh, so integrate one, you get the t dx is b, uh, some constant, Integrate again, we get uh, T is Bx plus C. At x equals zero, we know temperature is Te. At x equals uh, H, we know it's uh, Ts. H is the distance between the plates there. Um, and so therefore, we can solve that equation. Uh, and um, well, there's a the solution there, okay? So the temperature is equal to Te, the temperature at the bottom, plus Ts minus Te, x H to the minus one. So it's, it's basically just a linear temperature gradient across the sample. Um, and the temperature just increases, increases as you go up in a sort of linear fashion like that. It's exactly the same as a parallel plate capacitor, okay, with, with the, uh, the voltage increases as you go between the plates in a linear way, okay? In fact, exactly the same equation applies. Okay, so um, let's have a look at a, 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 a more slightly more complicated case where we have a, um, a, uh, a gas between the two plates. Okay, now if we have a gas, um, then uh, kappa is not constant. Kappa goes as some constant times t to the half. We won't worry about this constant is, we've derived it, but we just keep it as a constant here. Okay, so we need to solve in steady state, uh, this will be equal to dt dx, uh, t 
divided by um, uh, times some uh, heat capacity thing times uh, heat capacity, maybe inverse heat capacity, but anyway, it's zero, okay? And that's zero. So in steady state, we're gonna get that. Uh, and uh, we can integrate that once, we get this, okay? And then we have to muck about to integrate this again because we have got t to the half dt, we've got a dx there. Uh, so when we integrate again, we integrate this equation, integrate it once more, we get t to the 3 on 2 equals bx plus c. Uh, and we get a nonlinear profile now. The temperature gradient, the temperature itself, does not vary linearly between the plates, but with this funny power law dependence. But at least we can still solve it. So in steady state, you can still solve that kind of problem. Okay. Hmm. All right, next slide. So we've dealt so far with um, the case where you have uh, the hydrodynamic regime, where, where the particles are, are colliding a lot, the gas particles are colliding a lot across your system. Now it's possible to look at other regimes where that's not true. And the most obvious one is the Nunsden regime, where you have very low pressure, okay? So what's happening here is that the get here we have two plates maybe separated by a small distance d, um, and because d is so small, the gas molecules might not actually hit any other gas molecule between collisions. Okay, so if the pressure is low, or the distance between the, the plates is small, um, we end up with a system where there's no collisions between the molecules in crossing between the plates. So a gas molecule might come down here, collect some energy from that plate, go up to here and hit the other plate and distribute that energy to this plate. Okay, and that's the way you can transport energy, transport heat. Okay. Now we're going to make some approximations here, some pretty uh, scandalous approximations, but uh, they turn out to be reasonably true. Um, so if all the molecules move the same speed, V, the number of molecules hitting a plate of area dA per unit time is given by this thing I we described before, which is I V N D A. Okay, oh sorry, quarter V N D A. Uh, each of these will, if each of these gives up all its energy, that's the energy of a particle, kinetic energy to the plate, the total transfer energy per unit time per unit area would be that going to one of the plates. Okay, so we get this new uh, speed cubed here. So the average value of V cubed for a gas at temperature T, you can calculate from kinetic energy from what you've been shown, from kinetic theory, from what you've been shown before, uh, from the maxwell boltzmann distribution, uh, and you will end up with that, okay? That's the value of uh, the velocity cubed, the speed cubed. So let's try and calculate the, um, the power per unit area hitting the wall, okay? If we do that, uh, you will find it's just equal to uh, the pressure times a half times the mean speed of the molecules, okay? Now, in a real system, the gas may be at temperature T naught and the wall at temperature T1, okay? And if we assume the gas molecules come in at T naught and leave at T1, so they come in at some speed, uh, which is T naught, um, and then leave at some speed, which is T1, Okay, they've got they've been heated up by the wall. Okay, there'll be a net transfer of power per area from the wall to the gas of that, and you can argue that yourselves if you don't think about it for long enough. Okay, that's the net transfer of heat from the from the wall to the gas. Okay, uh, and so if we have one wall at temperature T two, and another wall at temperature T one, so here's our two walls T one T two T naught is our gas temperature then the heat flux between the walls, you can calculate it, it's a half times the pressure times the mean speed of the molecules times T1 minus T2 times T1 to the minus 1. And the conductivity in this case actually does depend upon the pressure. And if we go way, way back down to here, uh, back in our, our, uh, our results, where were they? You will see the, the experimental bit. We're down in this regime, the pressure is low, uh, the mean free path is high, and you do find that the, uh, in some sense, this is measuring something different, of course, but in some sense you get a conductivity which is proportional to the pressure. So it does depend on the pressure if you're in the Nunsden regime. Okay, so where are we now? All right, so um, this 
so far we've just been discussing gases, rarefied gases normally. But we can apply this same um, uh, calculation to solids. And in fact, this was done by a man called Paul Druder in uh, 900, a long time ago. Um, and he proposed, proposed a very simple theory both for heat, heat conduction and electric conduction in solids. Okay. Now, solid state physics really didn't exist in 900. Um, and in part, it didn't exist because quantum mechanics didn't exist. Um, and you can't do a lot of solid state physics without quantum mechanics. It's, it's, a, it's a quantum system. Um, and also, all the theory of, uh, of how to deal with large numbers of interacting particles and particles interacting strongly were, just didn't exist. Okay, but that didn't stop Druda. He, he forged ahead. Okay, if you, you know if you don't know what you're doing, um, you just use the simplest theory you can possibly do. And so he treated the three electrons in a in a in a in a solid as an ideal gas. He said, "Oh, look, look, a solid's got some nuclei. It's got some bound electrons and some free electrons, like these ones here, um, and they collide with the stationary ions and they reach equilibrium." Uh, and what he did was he calculated the um, the uh, electrical conductivity sigma. Okay. Uh, along well, using a calculation very, very similar to what we've uh, just performed for diffusion heat conduction. Uh, and of course, he finds this result here, which is that the um, the uh, electrical conductivity depends on the number of free electrons per unit volume, this density of free electrons, the electron charge here, um, the time between collisions, tor, and the electron mass. And that's, that's, his, that's one of his results. Okay. And... Um, that, re that result is entirely classical. The theory is entirely classical because they didn't have quantum mechanics in 1900. Okay? Uh, but in, um, uh, in 1933, two of uh, the greatest physicists who ever lived, Sommerfield and Hans Bethe, um, both uh, had a crack at this problem uh, using proper Fermi Dirac quantum mechanics statistics. Okay? Still using this idea of a gas, but uh, using proper quantum mechanics. Uh, and they got the same answer as Druda, despite having done a much more complicated calculation. And you can do the Druda model both for um, DC and AC connectivity, uh, and you can say, well, basically, as textbooks will tell you, the Druda model provides a very good explanation of DC and AC connectivity in metals. Okay, so it's a very, it's a very good, but very simple model. And there's, there's, there's Summerfield, and there's, um, there's Hans Bethe. Hans Bethe is uh, famous for a large number of things, but he's the man who first figured out how the sun works, which is a fairly uh, uh, important problem, I should think. Okay, so um, the Wiedemann France law uh, is related to this. Now, this is a much, much older empirical law uh, from 1853, we can see. It's probably from some time earlier as well, but the, the, the data would have been collected over a, a period of long period of time. And it says that the ratio of the thermal conductivity, the electrical conductivity of a material, of a metal, in fact, uh, is proportional to temperature. So you got you measure the thermal conductivity, you measure electrical conductivity, which appear to be quite different things, okay? Uh, and you find that they're proportional to temperature. And Druda, with his model, was able to give us what the proportionality constant is. Uh, it's just got, you know, uh, numerical constants plus Boltzmann constant electric, electric charge, okay? Uh, and that has a number. You can write the number there. Um, and the Druda model that explains this and allows you to calculate that uh, constant there. Um, now, the Wiedemann France law, uh, however, is only approximate because L differs somewhat for different metals, whereas Druda would say it's the same for each metal. If you look at this, there's nothing, nothing particularly uh, that, dis that you know, distinguishes sodium from iron. Um, and also, it depends somewhat on T, but still, it's uh, the Druda uh, calculation of this is still very, very important here. Okay, so that's the Wiedemann France law, um, which is, of course, predates all this kind of calculation. All right, now we come to um, the weirdest result, okay? And the weird result is about gas viscosity. So we've done a lot of transport calculations. You've got diffusion, we've got, which is a matter of transport, we've got electrical conductivity, we've got thermal conductivity. Now we're going to do viscosity, which is, viscosity is about, really about um, uh, transport of momentum. Okay, so I'll remind you what the picture looks like for viscosity. We have a wall here. Um, and that's the x direction, that's the z direction, 
and we have um, suppose we have a plate here being sheared on imagine this thing rotated around so it's, uh, it's upside down like this okay and so this plates being sheared um, and so what happens is at the wall the speed is zero and as you go to the, the other plate, it, it, the speed picks up. So you have a series of layers, if you like. You can imagine there are these are imaginary layers, each one moving a little bit faster. Okay, and we get transport of um, of momentum uh, in the z in the x direction. So x x x uh, x momentum p x, um, and it's transported between these layers. Okay. Now, the thing to remember about this, uh, which you often forget, okay, people often forget this, is that this velocity profile here, this velocity profile which is small here and getting bigger and bigger and bigger, is a very weak velocity profile compared to the much larger random velocity. So in, in here, give a gas, there's all these particles shooting about all over the place, right? They're going crazy. Let's erase all this crap. Okay, let's, 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 here we go. Okay, why can't I can't erase it? Erase entire, erase highlighter, erase entire stroke, that one, yeah. I don't know, anyway, let's, let's erase the damn thing. Why wasn't it working? No. No. Anyway, we won't worry about that. No, don't do that. Done. All right, so um, on top of this, there is a, uh, a very, very large random velocity component, and the superimpose is a much slower, steady component. Okay, so the the speed might be this, but the random speeds might be much higher, 300 meters a second, uh, several orders of magnitude higher. Okay, so um, let's look at the momentum in the up x direction carried by particles on either side of the z equals zero plane. So here's a z equals zero plane, and we have the following picture. There's a slow layer here and a fast layer here. This is the z direction. And again, we're going to look at gas particles between minus lambda away and lambda. Okay, so we've got the gas molecules within a, a mean free path. Okay, those arriving from the right carry a momentum in the x direction of this, so mass times the velocity at lambda, and though from the left, those leaving the left carry the following momentum, which is that. Okay, and we can write this as the velocity at zero plus lambda dvx dz. Taylor series expansion in both cases. Okay, so the net flux of momentum is um, the right minus the left, okay, uh, and that gives us this result here. Okay, it's exactly the same as the case of uh, transport of, uh, of matter. Uh, so if you were doing the transfer of momentum, uh, and if we cancel out all these bits here, that cancels with that, we end up with this as our current of momentum. So that's the current of momentum carry, I mean, X momentum uh, due to transport in the Z direction. So you can see it's a bit complicated. Now, um, this thing here is effectively the viscosity, okay? Um, now we just need to use our usual fudge factor of two thirds and we get our expression here for the viscosity. And our expression is this, okay, a third of the mean speed times lambda times the density times the mass of the particles. And you can write that again in all kinds of different ways. Um, you write it in terms of the molar mass and the diffusion constant and the constant no the number of moles per unit volume. You can write it like this. You can write it in terms of the pressure and the temperature and the diffusion constant if you like as well. So there are all kinds of ways of writing this, okay, depending on what you are able to measure. So let's look at how that Viscosity depends upon the pressure and the temperature. Okay, remember viscosity is is a measure of how easy easily things flow. High viscosity things flow um, will have will have will, well they won't flow very well. Low viscosity things will flow very they were very slippery and slow flow very well. Okay, so if we look at our thermal conductivity kappa and our viscosity eta, um, they both basically look very 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 similar, and in particular. As far as the gas pressure and temperature goes, they both have the same dependence. Okay, because these, all these things are the same, right? That's a constant and that's a constant, right? So they don't, not, they don't vary with temperature or pressure. And this term is the same in both cases. Okay, so basically we expect 
uh, the thermal conductivity and the viscosity to have the exactly the same dependence on temperature and pressure. Because we, and we already know what that is. So we know, for instance, let's look at the, the simpler case first, which is the, the um, dependence of the viscosity on the temperature. Okay, and what we find is the viscosity scales as the temperature of the half for a gas. Okay, that's a weird result. A very weird result, not as weird as we're going to get, but it's pretty weird because it says the viscosity increases with temperature. And the reason for that is the momentum flux is greater at higher temperatures. Okay, now that's true for gas. This is, for, this is also for gas, right? Okay, for liquids, if you do the experiment for liquids, you find that uh, viscosity tends to decrease with temperature. If you take engine oil, for instance, in your car, um, when you first start up your car, um, the viscosity is really high. Okay, and as the temperature heats up, um, the viscosity gets, gets lower and lower and lower, and that's what all those funny um, 20W50 symbols on, on oil, oil cans tell you. Tell you they tell you how, what, the, what the viscosity is at different temperatures. Okay, so um, for liquids, we tend to get um, viscosity decreasing with temperature because what happens is, here's our, here's our liquid, crowded out liquid here, uh, and... Um, it tends to be easier for the molecules to move between all these interstices and break little, you know, intermolecular forces at high temperatures. Okay, high temperatures and intermolecular forces mean nothing, uh, and um, you get a lower viscosity. Okay, so let's look at our, let's look at this if this is true for a gas. So we remember our prediction is eta goes as t to the half. Um, now uh, we can't confirm this from this data, but this is some data uh, for different temperatures, up to four degrees, for different, different you know, many different systems, oxygen, nitrogen, and air. Okay, uh, and you will see, uh, even though we can't confirm the t the half variation from directly from this, although you probably could if you uh, if you prepared to fit it, um, you can at least see that in all cases the viscosity increases with temperature. And so that's that's at least confirmed here. And that's that's a weird result. You don't expect that for a system because for ordinary liquids. Um, you just don't see that. Okay, you see the exact opposite. And here's here's the example of liquid. Here's here's some olive oil, and here's Popeye's uh, girlfriend or wife. Call this that's not olive oil. Um, and uh, here's the viscosity of olive oil versus temperature. Uh, the experimental data is the points here, and you can see it goes down. Very different to what you get for a gas. Okay, and so that's one of the great things about kinetic theory. They've made this prediction, which is fairly counterintuitive and it's correct okay now let's go to the weirdest prediction of all which is the dependence of viscosity on pressure now pressure means density pressure is the same thing as density because if we have a constant temperature we've got pv equals n kt so p equals n on v kt this is our density so pressure at constant temperature is the same thing as density now i didn't i didn't tell you but all this work uh, was done by James Clerk Maxwell, okay, in the uh, middle, uh, middle, middle section of the 19th century, um, and Maxwell predicted in 1866 all the things we just seen uh, on the basis of the kinetic theory which he was developing, um, and uh, it's a rather robust theory, an amazing theory because it basically takes microscopic stuff and predicts macroscopically measurable quantities, viscosities and diffusion constants and all this kind of stuff. So it really is, is really grown up science. Okay. And he predicted, amongst other things, that the viscosity is independent of the density. Okay. Now, this result is simply ludicrous. Okay. Because if I take a pendulum and I put it in air and I let it oscillate back and forth, you know that it's going to be damped. And because it's going to hit a whole, a whole lot of gas molecules here, uh, and uh, that, that damping will eventually uh, cause it to stop, and that damping is caused by the viscosity. And you can work it out from Stokes drag if you were moving slowly enough. You know what the damping will be. Okay, you know it's going to be six pi eta uh, a the radius of your sphere uh, times v. That's the damping force. All right. Um, now, uh, so you know, and you know that if um, oh. Why can, I, why can I erase this stupid thing? Uh, erase entire stroke. I don't know. Just erase entire stroke. There we go. Anyway. Okay. You know that for this system, that the uh, that if I 
you know, at least you don't know, but you, you'd guess if I increase the pressure and the density by a factor of two, I would expect more damping. If I made it denser and denser, and I put more and more molecules here, more and more and more and more, I'd get more damping and, 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 and my pendulum should decay faster. Maxwell tells us this is not going to happen. He tells us that the viscosity is independent of the density for a gas. Um, and this, this simply can't be true, you think about it, because if I go to a, a system which has no particles in it, there won't be any damping at all. And if I go to a system which is really, really dense, so it's pretty much a liquid, there'll be lots of damping. Uh, Maxwell's theory breaks down in those two extreme cases, but uh, what he's saying in, in the intermediate area, we just have a, a, a very, fairly rarefied gas, um, you get a viscosity and a damping which is independent of the density. Um, now, um, well, it sounds crazy, but it's true. And in fact, it's very hard to find data on this because it's uh, because no one bothers to measure it because everyone's convinced that Maxwell's right uh, and therefore no one bothers to measure the result. But I found some data for nitrogen um, and here they've measured uh, the, uh, the pressure and therefore the density over one order of magnitude from one to 10 atmospheres. So here's, here's the pressure. Um, there we go, there's the pressure. Uh, the temperature they've tried to keep constant, which they almost certainly have. Uh, there's the density. Uh, is this the density? Oh, no, that's from the yeah, that's density, right? The density changes a lot. Uh, and here's the viscosity. 17.893, 17.766, 17 17.797. Basically, you get one order of magnitude change the density, and the viscosity basically doesn't change. It changes by 0.6%. Okay? So Maxwell's results are correct. Okay? Uh, and... Um, here's Maxwell, here's, here's, here's James Clip Maxwell, that's his wife Catherine and their dog Toby. Um, and uh, because um, when Maxwell was uh, in his various academic positions at, at Aberdeen and, at, and London and at Cambridge, um, he didn't have much in the way of um, experimental support. Uh, so first what he did was he did the calculation uh, and then um, he decided to do some experiments because the calculation, of course, sounds ridiculously stupid. Uh, you get the result and it sounds like, you know, you must have been drunk when you were calculating it. Um, uh, and uh, him and his wife did not have any children, um, so she could help him with his experiments, and so they did that at home. Uh, and they built some apparatus. Um, here's the apparatus they built. Oh, I suppose they had some technician build it, I should think. It's a pretty, pretty sophisticated piece of apparatus. Uh, you've got here um, some bowl here which contains the gas and some moving veins here, which give you uh, the damping of the thing, and there's probably some torsional pendulum up here, which you can measure the period of. Okay, um, and that's the, that's the piece of apparatus which they still have in Cambridge. Um, and um, Mrs. Maxwell helped um, mainly, I think, by stoking the fire, uh, and maybe by taking some measurements as well. Um, and uh, because this has to be done at different temperatures, and it has to be done at constant temperature, in fact, so you've got to make sure your gas is at constant temperature. Um, and um, when they did this, they found that Maxwell's theory was actually correct, uh, and uh, which is a very bizarre, uh, bizarre result. Um, so, you know, Maxwell proposed in 1860, the experiment's on 1966, but he proposed that the gases produce, um, possess a distribution of velocities, okay, in the kinetic theory. So you can have gases which, you know, this one can be moving fast, this one can be moving slow. That, that was a, a, con, a rather unusual suggestion because... People thought that if you have lots of collisions, you will get equal molecular velocities. No, that's not true. Um, however, he was troubled with his own proposal because it had the curious result that viscosity is independent of the pressure, uh, which was certainly very unexpected and sounds crazy. Okay, And uh, Maxwell and Catherine made the first reliable measurements of gas viscosity, and they basically confirmed Maxwell's result. Okay. Um, as I said, these experiments were made using the apparatus in the attic of their house, and the temperature was controlled through appropriate stoking of the fireplace. Um, the results were reported in 1866, and they were a triumph of kinetic theory because they showed a result which kinetic theory predicted and which nobody expected, and which still people, if you think about it for 10 seconds, you'll think, oh, it's crazy. But it's crazy, uh, and it's also true. And we will end uh, the lecture on... Uh, on 